1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 13 today. I'm going to walk through what the Apostle Paul is trying to show the church in Corinth. So as you're turning there, chapter 12 and 13, we'll pray. Father, we thank you for this time that you've given us to come together as a fellowship and praise you and honor you, to, to truly learn what it means to fear you, to revere you, to trust you. And I, and I just thank you for this time. Lord, lead as we walk through your word. Be honored, be glorified. Open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to be soft and sensitive to your word. And take us captive, Lord. It takes, it takes a true work of your Holy Spirit in our life to break down the walls of pride that we've learned to put up our whole life. Break through, Lord. There's things we desperately need to hear today. And speak them to us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul is going to address spiritual gifts within the body and how they're used and how the church in Corinth has used them incorrectly and it's brought into the body, into the church of Corinth, division. It's caused destruction. The spiritual gifts are given by God, by the Holy Spirit, to the church so the church can grow and live. Think of this uh, real simply. We, I'm born, I live, I die. Any other human beings you know that are that consistent? Like maybe everyone? Every one of us in this room were born. If you weren't born, raise your hand. All right, okay. Every one of us in this room are living. If you're not alive, raise your hand. Mark, put your hand down. No. The, uh, and every one of us will die. That's consistency. And what Paul is trying to show the church is God has given you spiritual gifts. And what you've done is, is you've used them consistent in a consistent way. And it's brought death into the church. If you read the Gospels, you're going to read them, you're going to find out that the Pharisees and the Sadducees looked at Jesus and they said, this guy is the most inconsistent person in the world. He's over here, he's over there, he's up there, he's over there. There's nothing consistent about him. And that's because he was God in the flesh. And I'll tell you, it's an amazing picture that's painted in Scripture here. And I pray that God gives us ears to hear it because God gives gifts gifts to the church there are many denominations out there today they say well you know God gave gifts to the church back then but they're just not applicable today that's a lie that's go look at the certain denominations that stand upon that and find out it's not life within their fellowship it's actual death there's division from within and this is what causes the division from within is the misuse of spiritual gifts says in verse 1, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols. However, he says, you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Paul begins to start to share with them about spiritual gifts and how important they are in the body and if they're misused, how they actually destroy the body from within. And he starts by letting them know, he says, you know, concerning spiritual gifts, and all of a sudden he's talking about, you know, when you're a pagan, you were led, and, but you were led, and if anybody says Jesus is a curse, you know, it's not from the Holy Spirit. He says Jesus Lord is from the Holy Spirit. You're like, what does that have to do with a spiritual gift? <laughs> it makes no sense. But it makes a lot of sense in the church in Corinth. Because what he says here, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, literally means with respect in regard to the spiritual gifts. He says, I don't want you to be unaware or ignore. I don't want you to disregard what I'm about to say because you just don't care. I don't want you to disregard what I say because for some reason it's not important to you. But what I'm sharing with you concerning spiritual gifts is more important than anything else right now in your life because you're trying to exercise these gifts and you're causing division in the body with them. 
So I'm telling, you know, what I'm telling you is really important. So he says, you know that when you were pagans or before you were saved, he says you were led astray to mute idols. Led astray simply means you were taken captive by them. Right? And then he says, however you were led. And this term led just means you were induced. Literally, it means this. Back before you were saved, you were induced by these false idols to have an open mind to spend much time in their presence. Applicable today? You thought nothing about sitting down and reading a book all day. You didn't think twice about it. In fact, as you read that book, you were taken captive by it. Or you thought nothing about sitting down and putting your tunes on, listening to them all day. You didn't think twice about it. And the truth is, if it wasn't centered around Jesus Christ and the truth of God's word, you were taken captive. You say, I have an open mind. <laughs> I stand open in this. And he's saying, but you were led astray. You weren't drawn to Jesus Christ. You were drawn to a false idol because you were drawn to something. He says, however, it was leading you. So here's the proof. You say, I have an open mind, but you were being led. They're taken captive. You know, say a couple, we could say, put some headphones on, listen to ACDC all day. And you're just like taken captive and or put the headphones, listen to country music all day. It's like, it's no big deal. Put, put your favorite movie on, be taken captive. It's no big deal. And Paul's saying, it's a big deal because you're the body of Christ now. Somewhere along the way, when you ask Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life, the Lord of your heart, when did you take back your life and become taken captive by that which took you captive simply when you said you had an open mind? How many people say, oh, I got an open mind, I'm willing to listen to everything. I accept all people for who they are. Except Jesus, don't tell, him. Don't tell me what to do with your Bible. When the Word of God is supposed to be the standard of our life as believers. And he's saying to the church, you're causing division because you're misusing these spiritual gifts. He says, therefore, verse 3, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So when he says, therefore, I make known to you. So he's saying, what I am about to tell you is, is certain and it's a truth that can be depended on on. This is something you can build the foundation of your relationship with God on. Anything else will waver. And he begins to say, no one can say Jesus is accursed uh, by the Spirit of God. The simple term, Jesus is accursed. So, in the city of Corinth, just before Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD, there were reports that were given by the Jewish communities to the people about Jesus just like there are today by many people about Jesus. So there was a report that was circulating by the Jews, and it went something like this. This Jesus, he was a wicked and detestable person who was put to death by his own countrymen. He was hanged on a tree with the accursed, and he is called accursed. And that was something that was passed around the different towns from the Jews as they went out. So there was a big thing out there, a report about Jesus being accursed because he was a wicked and evil person. And they even had a term uh, for him. It was called Jesus the perverse because they say he perverted the law. Perverse means twisted, it means add my own thing to it. So they're saying this is Jesus the perverse. And they even had uh, an abbreviation for him it was J-E-S-U. Uh, and it was a Hebrew term. It means he is a lie, he's an abomination, and let his name be blotted out from our lives. And that was something that they proclaimed at that time. And they did it because they said he blasphemed God. Now in our day and age today, we have some terminologies like blaspheme. First thing we think of is swearing. And yet that's not what blaspheme means then. To blaspheme someone means you've taken on their countenance. 
And Jesus said, I am God. He said, I am the father of one. They said, you blaspheme God. What right do you have to proclaim deity? And so they shot it out. Let this man be accursed. Let him be hung and put on a tree. That's amazing to me because the day and age we live in today, there's a report in a pressing that goes about the Christian church today that says, well, Jesus, yeah, he died for our sins and that was great. He was a good man, but he's not deity. He's not Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Don't begin to tell me that he's deity. Word Trinity is not even in the Bible. I'm going to stand on that. Oh, really? Maybe the word Trinity is not in the Bible. You know the word Bible is not in the Bible? And yet the theme is there all the way through. Go back to the very first sentence in the Bible. In the beginning, what's the next word? God. That's the word Elohim. El is singular, means one. Ella is plural. And Elohim means triune, three in one. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The book of Hebrews teaches us that, that Jesus was there with God in the beginning creating all things. That he is the creator of all things. So when they make this statement, literally, uh, they did it because they considered what he said, that claiming to be God, that he would be accursed, anathema. This is him accursed. So there was a big press that went around and a report, don't believe in this Jesus. And it's an amazing thing because for someone who just says, I believe in Jesus. I trust him as my Lord and Savior. And then, and then it comes time in the crossroads of their life when they come to that crossroads and they have to live that in their life. Then the truth really comes out. And, and what they really believe comes out. Because you can say it with your mouth all day. But when you come to the crossroads of trial and affliction and pain and suffering or whatever it may be, and you come to that place, your life will show if Jesus is your Lord or if he's just a curse to you. It's just someone I open my mouth and talk about. But if he's really there, and Paul is driving this home because when God gives spiritual gifts to the church, he's given them to the church for the purpose of the body coming to life, to bring life into the body, into the church. Nowhere, anywhere in Scripture is a spiritual gift given so I can become something or so I can feel good about myself. And nowhere is a spiritual gift given because I'm so holy and I'm so pure. Nowhere is a spiritual gift given that way. It's given to all believers so that they might lay down their lives and pour that gift into the body so the body might have life. It's an amazing thing, and that's what Paul's pressing at here. So he says, no one, this, this report, you want to hear, nobody by the Spirit of God. If somebody comes in and says, God told me that Jesus is accursed. You say, sorry, man, God, is, God lied to you, or the God you believe in told you that, but Jehovah God Almighty did not say that to you. Because Jehovah God Almighty would reveal to you His Son, your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And He would not be revealed to you any other way than that. And that would be the triune nature of God reveals that. The Father reveals the Son. The Holy Spirit takes the revelation of the Son and drives it home in your life. That's how the triune nature of God works in us. If not, all we do is argue points all day. You know people that have just different religious authorities? You ever meet them? And they have some point they hold on to, and I'm going to argue, and it's just a big argue. Where's the love of God in that? Sorry, it's not there. But the love of God is driven home when Jesus Christ is Lord. So he says, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. This term, Jesus is Lord, means no, Jesus is Jehovah. That's what it means. No one can say Jesus is Jehovah unless, except by the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit reveals the deity of Christ through the teaching of God's word. And what he means very strongly here, the implication is that if I were to say to you, Jesus is the Lord of my life, or I say to you, to me, who's Jesus to you? 
oh, he's a savior, and oh, he's a great redeemer, and oh, he's this, that, and the other thing. Who is he to you? To me, he is the Lord of all. And what does that mean? The implication strong. It means Lord of all. What does all mean? Everything. All means everything. <laughs> all means all. That's all all means. It will never mean anything different. It means all. So, so he's the Lord of the angels. He's the Lord of mankind. That implies that which is good, that which is bad, all of the righteous, all of the wicked. It implies all that has ever been created. He is God, the creator, and now the creator is head of his church. That means his blood has espoused his bride. And he's purchased her from the dregs of this earth and saved her so that she might be with him. That's the implication here. And it's a very strong one. And I think in today's day and age, you know, we, we can get wrapped up in the religiosity of Christianity and totally bypass this personal, intimate relationship that God wants to have with you so you can pass that on to someone else. When God pours his love into you, why is it there? Is it there for you to feel good? Because in two days, you won't. Within two days, you're going to face something in your life and you're going to have a bad day. Anybody ever have a bad day? They have bad days. Oh, but the love of God is in me. Of course it is. He put it there. Doesn't mean you're not going to have a bad day. But that love that he's given to you, he wants now to go through you to those around you. How do other people know that God loves them? How do these kids know? Because we sent them a shoebox that God loves them. Little children that never heard that God loved them. Never heard Jesus died for them. They received a little gift, opened it up, and, and there's a smile and joy on their faces. So much so, this little girl, we just saw that. She said, the word of God has filled my heart. It keeps me. The word of God filled my heart many years ago. You know what? It still does. It still holds me. It's still the passion in my life. It's still the drive inside me. I pray it's that in you. That's what Paul's saying here. You've been given a gift, but what drives the gift? Oh, you can speak in tongues, and you can climb mountains, and you can do all these great things, but what's driving the gift in you, and is that gift being poured back into the body where it can be strong? He says, no one can say, Jesus is accursed. If it's the Spirit of God, that's not the Spirit of God. But anyone who can say, Jesus is Lord, and the implication of what that means, that is the Spirit of God, because God reveals His triune nature to His people. It's only by the Spirit of God that we can have a spiritual knowledge of Christ. It's only by the Spirit of God that we can have a strong affection to Him. Let me ask you this. You don't want to raise your hands, but did you wake up this morning thankful by how much you love Jesus Christ? Or did you wake up and you go, well, it's Sunday, we've got to get to church on time. And you've got to stop and, and look in your life. Where's that love there? Did you, did you, if you're a husband, did you wake up and look over at her and go, well, I'm so thankful that she loves me and I love her very much. Or would you wake up and go, man, man, I'm glad I get to start a new day. Whew. Where's the affection? It's only by the Spirit of God that you can understand the love that God has for you. And, and to understand, if you don't know it, you, regardless of how religious you are, you have to stop and say, Lord Jesus, I want to know that love. I want that love in me. I want to know you love me. Because if I know you love me just the way I am, it changes everything in my life. It gives me eyes to see in a different way. It gives me ears to hear in a different way. And a powerful picture painted for us in Scripture. And that's what Paul is showing there. So, what, so upon a whole, what the Apostle Paul is telling the church in Corinth, he's saying, listen, you may not like what I have to say. He said, but let a man pretend to do what he will. 
If he does not love Jesus Christ or believe in him, then he's destitute of his spirit. Because whoever loves Christ and believes in him can call upon him as his Lord by faith and in fear. No matter what gifts may be, he's a partaker of the Spirit of God. I mean, it doesn't matter how good I am. It matters who my Lord is. And God's saying, I have gifts I want to give you. Maybe you're part you know, of, a, of a church that's grown up thinking that, oh, it's your absolute surrender to this and it's your absolute perfection to this and then the Holy Spirit will pour his gifts on you. That's a lie. That's not according to this word. Who is your Lord who's the Lord of your life? And I talk about this a lot, but remember King Arthur in the days of the round table and he'd sit there and his knights would come in. They wouldn't walk through the door without bending their knee to him in reverence and in fear and honor. Which one of King Arthur's knights burst through the door and sat down? Yo, King, what's up? Pass me a chicken wing. Didn't happen. They came in and they, belt, they bent in fear and reverence. You're my Lord, my King. I bow before, what's your will? What's your desire for my life? I know how you view me. And that makes everything to me. And that's the picture that Paul's painting for the church. And, and from that, he starts in verse 4, and he goes on for quite some time. And we're going to read it. He says, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. Okay, there's all kinds of gifts that God gives. And there are people, maybe you've been part of a church where they have you sit down and they go, let's find out what your gift is. You fill out this piece of paper and how do you feel about this and what do you think about that? And they come down and go, oh, you have this gift. And you go and you start to use that gift and it just never seems to click. You want to know what your gift is? Seek the Lord. Lord, I, how can you use me in the fellowship that I'm a part of? God's going to go, stop. <laughs> what fellowship are you a part of? You still a part of that fellowship way back there? And you just come here for, for giggles and that's it? Whoa, whoa, whoa. What fellowship have you poured your life into? Or do you just, you know, a Sunday saint and a Monday ain't and don't tell me how to live my life. God's going to say, okay, what fellowship are you a part of? Well, this one, Lord. Okay, start pouring your life out into it. And you'll find out what I bless in your life. And you'll find out real quick what your gift is. Because don't think that your gift is your natural ability to do something. It's not. It's where you step and begin to serve. Well, where do I serve, Lord? What do I do? Look around. You see a need? Step into it. If I shut the door, you'll find out real quick. Don't go down that road. But if I open that door wide, pour your life into it. And I'll bring people around you that'll help you do it. He says there's a variety of gifts, all kinds of gifts, all kinds. And he says, but it's the same Spirit of God. It's the same Spirit that's the Holy Spirit of God. The third person of the Trinity that's leading me and leading you in our gifts and how they're used in the body. And then he says, there's a variety of ministries and the same Lord. And as we serve in different types of ministries, there's all kinds of ministries. You go to one church that's in the inner city, they have this great outreach into the soup kitchen and it's really going great. We come up here in the West River Valley, go, let's open up a soup kitchen. <laughs> You're like, to what, the homeless? Living up behind a tree? It doesn't work here. What does work here? Find out. Begin to serve and don't be upset if I shut the door down because I'm actively seeking to open ministerial doors for people. Maybe it's going to someone's house and vacuuming their home. Oh, Lord, are you kidding me? That bad, that dirty? How long do I... Maybe that's the ministry that God's going to open up. Maybe it's going fixing somebody's roof. Maybe it's painting someone's house. Maybe it's cutting somebody's trees. Maybe it's washing someone's feet. Maybe it's going to a home where they don't have the ability to wipe their own back end. We used to have a lady in this fellowship that would go to people's homes to the elderly and she would clip their toenails because she knew they couldn't reach them. Don't even remember her name. But she served the Lord mightily. What an amazing thing. 
There's many different gifts. There's many different ministries. But the same spirit leading and the same Lord we bow down to, that's Jesus Christ. There's no other Lord. He says in verse 6, there are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in persons. That means the outcome of them may be different in every one, but it's the same God we serve. Right? Sometimes we begin to serve in different types of ministries, and we think we know where God's going. Or back at my old church, this is what we did, and this is what the outcome was. God's saying, but you're here, and I'm asking you to do this, and what are you even worried about the outcome for? I'm asking you to do this, and you step into it and begin to serve. He says, but to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Every gift and every manifestation of the Holy Spirit in someone's life is to be poured back into the body for the common good. That means I, it doesn't... It shouldn't matter to me how I view or maybe what people say to me, you know, like we're listening to CDs instead of having a piano to worship. I shouldn't be able to go down to my office and curl up in a ball and say, what is this person thinking? What is this person? They said this to me and they said this to me. No, I don't know where God's going with it. But he does. Let him have his way in it. It's the same spirit. It's the same God. He says, for to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by one Spirit, to another the effecting of miracles, and to the another prophecy, that's the teaching of his word, and to another the distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, that's languages, to another the interpretation of those tongues, but one and the same Spirit works all things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. He says, for even as the body is one, yet as many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body. So also Christ, for by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we we're all made to drink of one Spirit. So what he's saying here is this. We, as the body of Christ, have all received the gift of God. That's the Holy Spirit. If you're a believer here today, you've received the gift of God. That's the Holy Spirit. The day you got saved, you received His Spirit. It means He's alive in you, and He has made you one in Christ. Look around. Look around. See everybody around you? Look. Look to your left and look to your right. He has made you one in Christ with them. He is not causing division between the two of you. Who is? You are. And he's saying, and you're doing it by your usage of the gifts he's given you. Because you're not using them in the way that he's given so he's saying this is the work. When you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, boom, you receive the Holy Spirit that second. And he's made you one in the body of Christ. So whatever church you go to where Jesus is Lord, you're one with the people there in Christ. That's what he shows. And then he says, we all confess the same Lord. Lord, that's Jesus, the God-man. That's the second person of the Trinity. We all depend upon the same God. That's the Father, Jehovah. We all depend. He's Father God. And we all minister to the same body. That's the church. And we've all experienced the same baptism. That's the receiving of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, so as to be controlled by Him. It's this way. You should be able to say in your life, without any ado, Lord, it's no longer about my ability. It's no longer about my talent. It's no longer about my way, but it's all about yours. It's about what you now want to do through me. It's not about what I have. It's about who you are. And if I let him, that's the Holy Spirit, he will take control of my life. And he will direct me down that road. And I'll have many crossroads there to choose from. 
And as I begin to trust him, he will completely direct. The Holy Spirit never leads you off course, ever, ever, ever. You lean upon him, you'll be on the right track. And so that's what he shows there in verse 14. He begins to talk about um, the human body. He's going to say that we've all received now um, the gifts of God, and God is using us to build one another up in Christ. So he says, for the body is not one member, but many. If the foot says, because I'm not a hand, I'm not part of the body, he said, it's not for this reason any less part of the body. Or if the ear says, because I'm not an eye, I'm not part of the body, and it's not for this reason, he says, any less part of the body, you know, what if the whole body were an eye? Where would the hearing be? I mean, imagine that. And people go, yeah, I'd like to be a part of the church, but I, you know, I'm not a hand. Well, what are you? I'm a foot. Nobody likes feet. You know, I come in there, I'd like to be a hand. Everybody shakes a hand. Hands get used for all kinds of things. And I'm a foot. I get in, I wrap a sock around me and stick me in a boot all day. That's what I am. Then they finally take me out at night, sit me down, and everybody's like, no, I don't want to hang out with him. Back off that. Woo, that's a foot. And without a foot, you, that body ain't walking nowhere. Without a foot, you, that body carries no weight. No weight. Your body, your, the, the body has a hand, it's got a foot, it's got an eye. He's saying, if it was just an eye, where would the hearing be? Imagine if you guys all came in, you just eyes. I'd have to do sign language. You wouldn't hear me. Just an eyeball. So he says, if the whole body were an eye, or if the, where would the hearing be? Where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one of them in the body, just as he desired. And if we all are one member, you know, where would the body be? But now we're many members, but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. He says, on the contrary, um, it's much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker and necess are necessary, and those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor, and our less presentable members become much more presentable, whereas our presentable members which we have, uh, we have no need of. But God has so composed the body by giving more abundant honor to that member which lacked, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. You know, and if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Let's just put it this way. Let's say you're at home, you're painting your face, it's in the morning, you're looking real good, you got your thing, you're all trimmed up, and your outside is perfect. You've worked hard to get your muscles in shape, so you look good. And as you walk out the door, one of those less honorable members in your body that never get seen, like let's say your lungs, stops working. Where do you go? You don't go nowhere real quick. You didn't paint them up to look good. You didn't work them out. They're just in there. How about a kidney or a couple of them? Let's say, you know, who wants to be a kidney? I don't want to be a kidney. I want to be a hand. I want to be an eye. But yet, where am I going without my kidneys? Where am I going without my intestines? Oh, that's gross. The body is made of many members. And sometimes we come in with a pride or a prejudice inside, and we deem the ones we deem as less honorable. And Paul's saying, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are never given by God so you could walk in pride in them and deem somebody else as less honorable. Because what gift do they have? I never see them here, and I never see them there, and what do they really ever do? Maybe they're the ones that stay home all day and pray for your soul. Maybe one of the reasons why you're still alive on this earth is because they're interceding for you. I have to tell you the church I was a part of, we had a lady that was on the prayer team like 20 years before, and she was an elderly woman, and she kind of just drifted off the scene, and nobody saw her for years. And I, I had found out about it, and they were like, well, she used to be on the prayer team, and I think she's living up at the old hospital in the town. You should go check on her. I'm like, of course I will. Has anybody seen her? Oh, I haven't seen her in 10 years. I'm like 10 years. So 
I went to her house, knocked on the door. And about five minutes later, she comes to the door. Yeah, can I help you? I'm a pastor from so-and-so. Oh, I, I used to go to church there. And Come on, I go inside her house. There's a refrigerator. She has all these prayer requests that the church would send out in their bulletins taped to her refrigerator from top to bottom. And, and the, the most recent one was about 10 years ago when she wasn't able to come anymore. And so she's still praying. I'm still praying for, for oh, oh, he's with the Lord. <laughs> yeah, he's, he went to go be with the Lord. Yeah, yeah, that was 20 years ago. And there she is, still faithfully praying. That's a member that some people deem less honorable. And yet she was serving the Lord in whatever capacity she could serve him, faithfully and honorably. You know, Paul shows that there it, it, just in an awesome way. Verse 27, he says, You are Christ's body and individual members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, gifts of healings, helps, administrations, various kinds of tongues. He says, are they not all apostles? Are they? Are they not all prophets? Are they? Are they not teachers? Are they? Are they not workers of miracles? Are they? Are they not? Do they not all have gifts of healing? Do they not all speak with tongues? Do they? He says, and do they interpret? Do they? Do they all do that? No, God gives a gift here and a gift here and a gift here. And those gifts are used for the body of Christ. Imagine if we all came in here and spoke in tongues. It would be out of order, big time. And if we all came in here to interpret, there would be absolute chaos. People would come in and at a new and they'd be like, these people are insane. What are they doing? Or if we all came in here, you know, uh, with apostleship, and we're like, well, everybody comes to church, and so we send you all back out. The apostle, you're sent by the Lord, go. What would you come for? So he's saying, you know, these earnestly desire the greater gifts, and I'm going to show you a more excellent way. What he's saying here is we've all received the gifts of God, and God is using us to build one another up. The analogy of the human body is to show the diversity of how the gifts are used. The body needs different functions if it's to live, and it's to grow, and it's to serve. And the different members of the body of Christ actually promote unity as they discover their dependence upon the Holy Spirit and one another. As they learn to, to not learn to lean upon their own natural abilities, but upon the ability the Holy Spirit is giving them so that the body of Christ may live and grow and have health and strength. You know how many people are out there for their own kingdom? in the name of Jesus Christ, to build their own platform, to, to make their own way, to have their own church. That's insane. Yet we're a fellowship of believers. We come together, and in it, God gives gifts into the body. And the gift that you've been given is to be used in the body that you're poured into. And, and the Holy Spirit is the power behind that gift and how it's used. And it will make the body live. It makes it inconsistent because it's a diversity of unity. But if it was consistent, then we'd all die because we'd all go one different direction, one way, there would never be change, and the next generation would never be reached. It would just swirl away to the way it was. Think of all the hymns we sing. We have hymn sings. We go to the nursing home. We all sing hymns. All the elderly people know hymns. Do they know any newer Christian music? Well, no, it's all hymns, and they're strong words, and they're real important. Really, has it altered and changed their lives? Is Jesus Christ the Lord of their life? Or do they leave the study and go right back to their room and back to the same old system? And all it is, all we do is put a Bible of study in there and it, and it never amounts to anything because it's consistent. Oh, we're there every day at 10 o'clock. Every day at 10 o'clock. Does the Holy Spirit have the freedom to come in and change? If he doesn't, who's leading the show? And is it a show? But if it's a fellowship of believers... The Holy Spirit is in charge. 
And he's leading those that are serving him. And the body begins to pour into itself the different usage of the gifts. And the body begins to grow. And the body begins to have life. Chapter 13. So this is how the gifts are kept in control. It's by the love of God leading them. If the gifts lack the love of God, they put the body to death. If the gifts of the Holy Spirit don't have within them, or in that person, the love of God, then it puts division and destruction and death into the body. Verse 1 of 13. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I've become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. This is all I am. If I don't have the love of God in me, and I open up my mouth and begin to speak, even in angelic tongues or the tongues of men, then all I am is a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If the love of God's not there, it's just noise. That's, that's, sla that's a slap in the face to, to a church that says that they're strong and they're grounded in Christ. And Paul has to drive this home. Where is the love of God in your life? Oh, I speak in tongues. That's great. Woo! Where's the love of God? You still look down on people? You still consider yourself above others? Do you still view people with contempt? Or disdain, where's the love of God? That gift that you've been given in tongues is now causing division in the very body you say you're a part of. That's what he shows here. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge and I have faith, even as to remove mountains, but I do not have love, what does it say? I'm nothing. Lord, I want faith. God's like, trust me. Well, I want to see mountains move. They'll move. Well, I want to see you work in my life. I will. Where's my love inside you? And how is it being demonstrated? You know the way I demonstrate my love to you every day? I look down upon you through the blood of my son and I don't see spot or wrinkle in your life. When's the last time I slapped you and condemned you for how bad you were? Never have. I love you. And I love you unconditionally. And I want you now to demonstrate that love. And I've given you gifts. Some in this fellowship, you have the gift of administration. You can handle books, you can handle things like a piece of cake flies right through. Some have the gift of healing. You could pray for people, watch them be healed. There's, there's all kinds of gifts given to the body. The gift of tongues and the interpretation of those tongues that would strengthen and grow the body in Christ. Yet without love, they cause division and destruction in the body. He says, verse 3, And if I give my, my, all my possessions to feed the poor, if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. I can, do, I can have the greatest show on earth, but without the love of God, what does it mean? If I pour my life out and I walk away from that at some time and move on to something else God has for me, and what I've not done is left the love of God behind me, what is that? I don't want to walk away from a place and have people go, he's a really nice guy. That Ron, he's a really nice guy. I want him to know, you know what, that guy left, and you know something? This, I understand, God loves me, man. Jesus died for my sins. And if that guy can be forgiven, I'm sure I can be forgiven. If God loves that guy, he must surely love me just as much. That's how the gifts are used. He says, love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Does not brag. It's not arrogant. It doesn't act unbecomingly. It doesn't seek its own. It's not provoked. Does not take into an account a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. That's an amazing statement right there. I look at my life and I go, whoa, I fall short on some of those big time, Lord. And he says, that's your love. This is my love. My love will never fail. And that's the love I love you with. 
And now by faith, I want you to trust me according to my word. And I want you to love others the way I love you. First thing we think of, whoa, how long? Putting up with him, putting up with hers. That's hard, Lord. God's saying, that's not what I said. Uh, this is my love for you. I'm telling you, I promise you. That's how much I love you. I want you now, by faith, trusting my son, to love others the same way. Start right there. Start right in your home. And begin to walk this out. And you will watch what my love in you will do. My love will make you patient. My love now, when you hand it out, will make you kind. It will make you not jealous. It will help you not brag. It will make you not arrogant. Because it doesn't act unbecomingly. It doesn't take into account a wrong suffered. It lets it blow right off its shoulder every single time. That's my love for you. And when you begin to hand it out, that's, you can see, and that's what empowers the spiritual gifts of the Holy Spirit to bring life into the body. If the spiritual gifts lack the love of God, they lack everything. And they bring into the body destruction. Verse 8, love never fails. It says if there's gifts of prophecy, they'll be done away. If there are tongues, they'll cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. That's an amazing statement. That means I don't have to get it. I know in part. I don't know whole. So I can sit, I can teach his word to you, and you can come up to me after and go, well, what does that really mean? And I can show you how brilliant I am in the scriptures and explain to you everything to your last detail. No, it's not going to happen. I'm going to go, I have no idea what that means. Well, how can you do that? You're the pastor teaching the word. <laughs> That's right. It's not my word. It's his. And he says, I know in part. I prophesy in part. That means the Holy Spirit should be the one leading me when his word is being taught. And then I can say, I don't know what it means. Read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Spend some time meditating on it. Ask the Lord to show you what it means. And while you're there, ask him to show me what it means too. Because I'm just walking. I know in part. I don't know in whole. It's amazing how many Bible teachers I hear in the radio who know everything in whole. That's scary. I don't. I, <laughs> he says, when I was a child, I used to speak like a child think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just also as I have been fully known. He's saying, when I was a kid, I talked like a kid, I walked like a kid, I act like a kid, but now I'm grown up and I can tell you straight to your face, I don't know the whole thing. I only know in part. So I'll give you my part. That's what, I'll give it all to you. The rest you trust the Lord for. And when we see him face to face, everything will be understood. You know, those people say to me a lot, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God this. I'm going to say to him, well, why'd you do that? And why'd you allow that? You won't say nothing. You're going to stand before him. You're gonna, he's going to love you. And you're going to go, woo, it's all gone. You're going to look at him and go, it was worth it all, Lord. I don't need to know nothing. Because I know you love me. And I am now with you for eternity. There is no question that ever needs to be answered for me. It's all answered right now just by beholding you. And that's an amazing picture given to us in Scripture. In verse 13, but now faith, hope, love. He says, abide in these three, but the greatest of these is love. So what he's showing here in 12 and 13 and why they're connected together, very important. This is how the gifts of the Holy Spirit are kept under control. By the love of God leading them and only by the love of God. It's by the unconditional love God has for us then demonstrated by us towards one another. We look at this and we find out, Lord, your love is enriching my life, and through me, it's enriching others. Lord, your love 
is edifying my life. And I realize now, walking this out, your life, not love, is edifying others through me. And, and your love in my life is enduring. It's what gives me the strength to face each day of my life. And I can realize now that through me, your love becomes enduring for others just as well. And it's the love, it's this love, the love of God, that releases the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives that we may serve and care for one another. There's a lot of stuff on TV. You can put it on, you can watch it, you can get on the internet and watch it and listen to people talk about the power of the Holy Spirit all day. And you see, it all points back to self. It all points back to me. And you'll have the power of the Holy Spirit to turn from sin in your life. And the power of the Holy Spirit to conquer things in your life. You know, the power of the Holy Spirit to be prosperous and send in your summer gift. You're like, knock it off. The power of the Holy Spirit is by the love of God in my life. Now using the gifts of the Spirit in my life and in yours to demonstrate His love towards one another. We're in a fellowship of believers where God is building us up to life. Not coming in and causing division unto death. There's enough out there in the world and what cloaks itself in the guise of Christianity that tries to cause division in the church. And what we have is the Holy Spirit of God who has given gifts to the body. Some of the gifts, maybe you walk in the door and you bring food with you. There it is. The gift of hospitality. What a blessed gift to have in a fellowship. Some of you come walking in, bring a, a, a water hose with you. Everybody's like, what's a water hose doing here? Because you know, Wednesday night you heard somebody's water hose broke, and I got an extra one. You come walking in, there you go, brother, the water hose. Praise God. There's a gift that helps right there. Works in so many different ways. God just uses it with his love and conquers hearts and brings edification and strength and victory. It's an amazing picture that's painted for us in Scripture. I pray that you have ears to hear what's being said here today. Let's go before the Lord and pray. Father, I thank you for this time you've given us to open up your word and to seek your face and to hear what it is that you have to say. And I understand, Lord, it's by your Holy Spirit that you can take your word and plant it into our hearts and by your Spirit water your word that it would take root and reveal your Son to us as the Lord and Savior of our lives. Father, I pray that you would take your word and do just that. Drive it home. Let it settle in our hearts and let it bear fruit for your glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.